All right, good evening, everybody. This is Steve with Real Progressives. I'm going to have an interesting show tonight. I tell you what, this is a gentleman that I have on that um, I met uh, back at the Take Back Democracy March in Washington, D.C. Uh, Dan Kinch, um, all around good guy, just really wowed me at the, uh, the event. Um, he does a solo performance uh, that I had never seen an activist perform before. You know, usually I see us activists fist in the air, but he did a dramatic rendering and it was incredible and it captivated me. And I sat there and I, I kept thinking, and we stayed in touch. And, you know, he heard a live stream the other night that I did regarding the fact that, you know, we've got a lot of people out there talking about inflation, talking about all these conspiracy theories and stuff. And I'm saying, hey, guys, put your money where your mouth is. We've got near-term extinction on the way, et cetera, et cetera. And he was like, I need to talk to this guy. So I said, Dan, let's bring you on to the show. So without further ado, let me bring on my friend Dan Kinch. Dan, welcome to Real Progressives. How are you tonight? Thank you, Steve. I feel great. Uh, hoping to have an interesting discussion here. I think I, we can do it. I think we can, too. Um, so, Dan... Talk to me a little bit. Let, explain to our audience what it is that you do. What I do is since the 1990s, I've been doing one person plays. And what I did was I picked people out who are necessarily not in the mainstream. You know, anybody can write a one person show about somebody famous. I wanted to pick on people who are trying to do things that don't necessarily have a lot of notoriety behind them. So I have written about a nuclear protester who's gotten himself arrested repeatedly over the last 30 years and on Good Friday 1994 fell on April Fool's Day. So he dressed as a clown and disabled a Minuteman missile with a hammer. And then he had a communion service on top of the, the silo. I've written about activists who've protested against Monsanto and Frankenfood. I've written about the people who sold Africa essentially into the ditch, uh, the folks who got people in African communities to essentially monetize their economies without understanding that once you monetize the economy, Chase Bank can come in and buy all your assets. So that's been where I've been for pretty near 20 years. The play you're talking about is called How to Stop the Empire While Keeping Your Day Job. And that was originally because I'd interviewed activists in the San Francisco community who'd been arrested repeatedly. And one of them said, you know, if I had this to do all over again, these are the rules I'd set. So he gave me some ideas and he gave me some inspiration. And when Occupy Wall Street came along, that's why I started doing the play. And it's been on YouTube. It's been around the world on the Internet anyway. Uh, it's been used as the opening piece for Occupy Los Angeles it used to have quotes from the play on the front of their Web page. So that's what I do. And how does that get me into a discussion about climate change and extinction, Steve? Um, I'll tell you how it does. Um, I had been gifted with a radio job uh, four or five years ago, and I got to do interviews with anybody I wanted to do interviews with. And it was the year 2014 when we were about to have the People's Climate March. And... I was speaking to a man by the name of Guy McPherson. Guy McPherson is a former professor at the University of Arizona. Uh, he was kind of shown the door. It's a complicated issue many years ago because his lectures about what the climate was doing were actually depressing his students, and they thought it was a good idea if he found another line of work. But... It was his estimation as a secondary researcher in climate that we are on the path to human extinction in a very short period of time. And it's something that as someone who's surveyed activist communities for 20 years now, 
I was amazed at how activists themselves were closing this out. They don't want to talk about this. Uh, it certainly wasn't something that the People's Climate March wanted to address very directly. But if you look at some of the science, it's entirely possible we're down to the last 10 years or less. And I know you as a parent might have some real opinions about what we should be doing about that as opposed to, you know, fixing the Trans-Pacific Pipeline or taking on Monsanto or something like that. Those are all issues that are important to the activist community, but we're talking about base survival. And not just of us, of all the species that we're putting into extinction every day, something like 200 according to the United Nations. So that brings me about to the play that I'm doing, but I'm willing to field questions about the science involved in how they're figuring this out. Uh, there are actually some interesting developments in the last six months about how fast we're heating up the world that people are just not aware of. It's not a mainstream media kind of story. Well, let me let me let me touch on this for a second because for the folks that watch me when I go live, Dan, most of them come here to learn about economics. Uh, we used right. to have some other people that would come onto the show. We had a we had a, a larger group of live streamers, and as we go through you know, attrition and so forth, we always end up coming back to Old Faithful, which is me, and that is the economy. But this is a very simple transition because reality is, is that so many of the silly concerns that people that don't understand economics throw at me when I say we need to fight to fix the environment today, not tomorrow, not, you know, some far way down the road thing, like right freaking now and dramatically do it, not like some weak, you know, wimpy way. I'm talking about bold, sweeping things. And the object here, and this is what I come down to, and I, I said it very nasty because I am angry and raging at the quote unquote progressive community because they're more worried about, well, what about the Rothschilds? What about the private banks? What about, it's like, you're a liar. You don't believe that the environment is going to hell in a handbasket. You don't believe that human life is on the line here. You don't believe any of this. I know it. You are a fake and a fraud and a loser. And a, I mean, I get so enraged when I see these fools go out there and reading these blogs about the economy, the coming economic collapse. And I'm like, guys, fuck the coming economic collapse. First of all, you don't know your ass from your elbow. Second of all, you really don't know economics at all you should be not speaking you should be learning and the other thing is is that you claim to be this environmentalist while we're sitting here telling you we got near-term extinction you should be throwing everything including the kitchen sink at it and instead you're sitting there talking about the freaking Rothschilds now I don't know about you but I want my kids to live and I want this planet to be inhabitable if it's not already past the point of of, of the event horizon that kills us all. So Dan, when it comes down to this environmental thing, our movement is full of people that claim to be worried about the environment, but really prove when they say the word Rothschild that they have no interest in saving human life. They are conspiracy theorists that have no interest in science. They have no interest in saving lives and they have absolutely no interest in bringing about a progressive revival with a new deal politics or anything else. They're steeped in conspiracies and it's going to end up being our death now. Can you explain to me a little bit about what some of the solutions may be to, if there is a chance at saving the environment? What, well, what can we do? Well, first of all, I, I, I concur with you on everything you've said so far. Um, my mentor in all of this, Guy McPherson, the person who helped me write the play, was is adamant that you know, if you think the economy is more important than the environment, try holding your breath while you count your money. Thank and you. that's the problem. People don't see just how immediate it is. Now, right now, we're at record low levels of summer Arctic ice. That's a big deal because the summer Arctic ice 
if it goes away completely, first of all, that wouldn't have happened in several million years. It wouldn't have happened when human beings are on this planet. But more to the point, if we lose summer ice, then we're going to have sunlight hitting a very dark blue ocean, which is going to speed up the heating of that ocean. Now, there are certain flipping points, if you will, certain tipping points that you're going to hit once the ocean warms up where you're not going to be able to have aquatic life. If we lose phytoplankton, for instance, which are a very fragile form of life, but they're also the foundation of the whole ocean. If you lose phytoplankton, never mind the fact that the krill and the other sea creatures aren't going to have anything to eat. That'll be bad enough. Phytoplankton are half of the world's oxygen. If we manage to screw up the oceans, and it looks like we're doing just that, uh, we don't have anything to breathe. We don't have anything to eat if we go past four degrees centigrade because wheat plants will not properly germinate at those temperatures from what we already know. We aren't going to have things like vegetables. Human beings are big mammals. We cannot thermoregulate in a temperature range hotter than what it is in India right now, which is somewhere around 50 degrees C. It can't happen. We can't survive in those temperatures. They're talking about putting 700 million chillers into India and Pakistan over the next 20 years. There's not enough natural gas to run them all. So back to your question, I think, what do we have to do? We have to stop thinking this is going to be easy. You know, I consider myself a progressive. I was part of the Green Party for a long time. Um, I have a lot of friends who consider themselves progressives. I flip out when somebody says we can burn hemp and everything will be OK. That ain't going to happen. There's not enough energy produced by hemp, first of all. And second of all, we don't we don't have any means of growing at all. You know, someone said the answer is to grow trees, to grow more trees, to absorb the carbon dioxide. We would need 1.7 billion acres of trees to stop. I'm sorry, I'm looking at someone just threw us a note, but we would need we would need basically all the arable cropland in the United States just to grow the trees that would take out one billion uh, tons of excess carbon dioxide per year. We're producing 40 billion tons right now. <laughs> so have we gone past the tipping point? There are a lot of people who believe that we have. Um, I'm of the opinion shared by people like Edward Abbey, the, the great environmental writer, which is that action is the antidote to despair. You don't have the luxury of laying back with this thing if you want to see your kids or your grandkids go on. You don't have the luxury of thinking we're going to solve this whole thing by everybody moving to electric cars and hemp for everything. It's going to take a lot of work and especially a lot of sacrifice. And we are not seeing it in the global north the way people are in Africa and Asia. Uh, the environmental group DARA says that there's already 5 million people a year dying from the effects of climate. So how do you get leftists involved in this? Because one of the arguments that I get into, not an argument exactly, but a conundrum, let's say, right? Why are we looking at issues of police killings, which are undoubtedly something the left should be involved in? But you know what? If we're not going to be here in five years, where do we prioritize or where do we prioritize taking off after the military? Yeah, we shouldn't have a military, but that's we don't need a military. Actually, what we need to do is figure out a combined agreement among the countries of the world to figure out how to stop that. That's going to mean figuring out a way to sequester 40 billion tons of carbon every year. That's going to mean figuring out some way to chill the oceans back to the point where you're not going to have a massive methane release from the Arctic poles. 
I don't know if that science is even possible right now, but I'm so bummed by the fact that there's a whole lot of people who are movement people who are saying, well, this will all be great because in 2018, we're going to take back the House, and in 2020, we're going to take back the presidency. Those don't do us any good. We're already passing the tipping points. We need to do something yesterday. You know, last night would be nice. So have, have, have we sort of reached a moment of Satori, if you will? I, you know, I, I want to say this, Dan. I, this, to me, is probably the most important thing that I'm getting from you. And, and this is how you and I can be symbiotic on this issue, because I come at it from an economic standpoint. You are coming at it from just pure science and salvation here. And, and you put the two together. And what I'm trying to say is, is that we can literally do anything that we scientifically have the means to do. There is no issue of solvency to do it. OK. And so right. it, within that construct, people sit there. We've got people and I'm telling you, I have horrible names for them. But we've got these gold standard people that run around saying all kinds of bizarre crap about how the United States is broke. Oh, my God. Look how broke we are. Bullshit. And, and they run around. They say these things. It's like great campfire fodder, but it's not real world shit. And they are literally killing people by slow playing us, being able to do the things we could do to satisfy those very things that would save the phytoplankton, that would save the planet. These horrific, crazy people. I mean, when I say crazy, I'm talking about the Alex Jones world, okay, where they're out there running after the friggin' Jewish bankers, and they're just crazed with this Illuminati stuff. We've got a situation that's right here, right now. Well, you have the ability to fix that. We could yeah. fix it now. Well, you also have a situation, and I, I see it in, in really bizarre lefty terms, where people are saying, this is all a plan by the Rothschilds. This is all the Rockefellers. They want us to depopulate. Well, depopulating would be nice, um, but if we don't do it ourselves, nature will do it for us. Thank you very much. They're good at it. They've done it five other times in history. So I don't. If the fact that limiting population growth happens to put you in the same mental camp as people like Steve, J Steve, um, sorry, sorry, saying Steve Jobs, and I, what I meant was Bill Gates. Okay, so be it. We are at population overshoot for what the planet is. We are living on on a finite planet, and we're trying to squeeze infinite resources out of it, and that's not gonna work. And the earth is telling us it's not going to work. There's a German chemist named Armin Reller, who I found out about 10 years ago, didn't even become part of my play because I thought this is such a bizarre idea. But Armin Reller says, we have 30 years of copper left. We have 20 years of some of the components we need to run computers left. It's not in the ground anymore. We've used it up. We have the people who argue for peak oil, and that's a whole separate argument because you have to factor in not just, we can make oil out of shale, it's just going to be so expensive and so limited that you don't have enough water to do it, you don't have enough resources to do it, and it's too expensive for the economy to survive. And by the way, why are we making oil anyway when we know it's killing the planet? Amen. Amen. So... Anyway, so back to the play. I'm, I've been taking this thing around. It's called Planet Hospice. And because there's a small punk rock band that's also called Planet Hospice, I've had to subtitle it A Theatrical Romp Through Human Extinction. And it's based on one of these lectures. And the lecture says, All right, we cannot get the carbon out of the atmosphere. We cannot avoid methane, and we can't keep the temperature at a level that human beings can survive. So what do we do next? And in the play, we talk about what are we really here for? You know, we are we going to go to war for the last gallon of gasoline on the planet? Are we going to go to war for the last wheat plant? Uh, or can we figure out a way at this late date 
to a stop to adopt a sort of point of view that people have when they're in hospice. So for instance, when you're in hospice, and I know this because you know I've had family members go through it, you know, having the last dime on the table is not a big deal. You know, there are people we love, people we care for. That's going to be the priority in a time of hospice. And it's also going to be a time when we have to figure out we are on a finite planet, but we need to share what we have. I mean, that's anathema to in a country like this where we worship people like, oh, I don't know, Ann Coulter, Ayn Rand, people like that who are so much into the accumulation of items. You know, it's like the old Don Henley line, uh, you don't ever see a hearse with a luggage rack. That's awesome. So that's what the play is about. Uh, I've toured it to Ithaca, New York. It opened in New York City last fall. We did just did it in Tampa, Florida, at the Tampa International Fringe. I've got other options coming up as time goes by. It's a one-person show. Uh, if you have a large living room and you can provide me with pizza and decent beer, I might come by and do it for you. By the way, by decent beer... Don't offer me Michelob Ultra, but um, I'm a theater person, and I can also talk, I think, in a way that people understand about what's going on here. And I should, I need to also point out, I'm not an original thinker on this. Again, you people who are listening to me right now should go to GuyMcPherson.com, which is the site for Dr. Guy McPherson, the man who introduced me the idea that we were facing near-term human extinction. He talks extensively about what we might want to do in terms of preparing ourselves for that. And he's not the only one. We have people like Peter Wadham. Peter Wadham has been doing oceanic physics, 50 excavate expeditions over his lifetime. And he says we're out of ice come 2020. Somebody offered me pizza and a great ale. That'll work too. <laughs> so, you know, and I try to be optimistic. I'm doing, I mean, I'm doing an entertainment piece. It, I think I almost ambush people when I get to the point where I'm talking about how close we are to the edge. And I say to folks, you know, if I were to go home and drown myself in a bathtub that's only half full, does that make me an optimist? <laughs> <That's> so, <laughs> yeah, it, it's kind of it's kind of dark. Or you have the old the old the old joke, um, which I've used before. Guy goes to a goes to a Catholic church. He goes in for mass. He listens to mass. He comes out. The priest is there, and he says, "Jim." Did you like the sermon today? And Jim says, yes, I like the sermon very much. And the man says, and the priest says, and Jim, you want to go to heaven? And Jim says, oh, no, not me, Father. And the priest is perplexed. He says, well, Jim, surely you want to go to heaven when you die. And Jim says, oh, when I die, sure. I thought you were getting a van to go right now. <laughs> and you see, the thing is, that's our problem with dealing with our own Mortality, you know, we all, you know, anybody who was a kid, anybody who had goldfish or hamsters, we all know that things die. We all just don't know when that's going to be, and we want it as far away as possible. And if, in fact, the folks that I'm quoting are right about the science, we need to think about it right now. What is the best use of your day? Is it going to be starting another uh, subway franchise or is it going to be letting the people that you love know that they are loved instead of doing lawn work for decoration purposes maybe you ought to plant a little garden because a society that's collapsing because the environment can no longer support human life we're going to have some problems ahead and oil is not going to get us out of those so that's kind of the basis of the play. 
by the way, people can go to my website, which is brooklynculturejammers.com. And I'll explain that name because it's very odd. Brooklyn Culture Jammers was originally started as a site to support the Occupy Wall Street movement. So I was writing articles about economic inequality and protest and the fact that we don't have I mean, one of the things that bothered me about the Occupy Wall Street movement, I kept thinking as I'm watching people getting pepper sprayed and beat up by cops and so forth, that at some moment we were going to have what I call the Bull Connor moment, that something happens that is just so appalling that we realize we have to change. And that never came. And that still hasn't come. It still hasn't come through the deaths of people like Freddie Gray or Eric Garner, or people like that. We just aren't getting it anymore. And opposition to empire is a really difficult and life-changing thing. I can't tell you how many people are no longer friends with me because, you know, oh, he's going to talk radical stuff. He's, he's going to be crazy. I don't really want him at my dinner party. So... You know, Dan, it's funny you say that. I want to just jump in for a second. Sure. You know, I have a shtick, and the way I approach things is in your face, no apologies. It really is a throat punch. And and the reason for that is just like nobody wants to face their own mortality when it comes to the concept of near-term extinction, nobody wants to pay attention to economics either, which right now, while we live in this society and it's still functioning, we have these tools that help us provision resources to get things done. Right. By understanding economics and not allowing anyone, and when I say anyone, folks, I mean anyone to lie and say the U.S. is broke. Anyone that says that should be immediately dismissed and not listened to because we have all the resources we need in terms of our own ability, our time, treasure, and our government makes its own freaking money, so it won't be an issue there. So what we need to do is we need to stop the lies because we got real shit. I mean, this makes me go nuts. Every person that acts like I'm, uh, you know, so the whole point of my shtick is the freaking throat punch to wake people up. I'm not here to be your best friend. I'm here to save lives. And if you don't like me, hopefully somebody goes around with a little dustpan cleaning up the mess I make and says it in a way that people, it's okay, Steve's just trying to tell you that we have the money to save the environment if it's still savable. If it's still salvageable, we have the ability to do that. But you've got to stop being a loser and talking about crazy nonsense about the Rothschilds and start being a winner and focus on saving the planet. But, but it, it really and it really does come down. To, it's that simple. It's that black and white, that cut and dry. If you love your kids and you talk about the Rothschilds, I question the love of your child. It's that simple to me. This is real shit right here, right now. And I don't Steve, know what more to do. Steve, don't hold back. Tell us what you really think. <laughs> well, that's what I'm trying to do. And that's the point, though. I am OK with being because if it if it gets people to wake up, OK, economic watching paint dry. It's watching grass grow. And so if people genuinely don't understand this stuff, they're not going to pay attention to a boring lecture about economics. So I've got to be a jolting alarm clock to get them to understand there are very real things at the end of the rainbow for all these lies and myths and bullshit we tell each other that we, you know, we peddle these lies from Alex Jones and wrong Paul and all the other people out there who are trying to keep us in Ayn Rand austerity. And somehow or another, this has creeped into the progressive movement, which blows my mind. And so it, without changing that narrative, Dan, there is no chance of us saving the planet because we need those resources to be able to do things. And like I said, right now, we have certain systems in place that allow us to provision and marshal those research, uh, resources. And with, we with do. The, with the population ignoring that, we're screwed. There is no way to get there. And that's. But they don't get it. And the thing is, I'm, I'm not in 
I'm not in the economy part of this. I don't understand it the way you do. And I will uh, plead ignorance on that. I am the simple artist. I sing, I dance, I tell the funny joke. But here's the thing. Whether we have the money or not, and I and you and I accept what you're saying here. Whether we have the money or not, that's not the question. The question is, do you think the human race should be around in five years? And it might not be ten years. It might not be five years. Um, one of the threats that's been talked about for several years now. You have an economic crash of the sort that we're looking at right now. What happens if the banks no longer exchange money with each other? What happens if they shut down the electrical grid? We've got 451 nuclear reactors that go into meltdown if they don't get diesel fuel, if the electrical grid goes down. That fries the planet. There, there's nobody who even wants to say that publicly. I mean, there are very few people who want to acknowledge that there's a problem. Mm -mm. You know, look, they were about to put uh, natural gas pipelines, and I think they still might be talking about it, through the ground next to Indian Point Nuclear Power Plant. I mean, what are you thinking? How could you work? Did you take a stupid pill today? Why are you doing this? And that's part of the ecological devastation we're seeing, but it's also part of us thinking we're just not going to die. And we all die. We know we all die. Uh, I don't know how to address somebody who thinks that this isn't the top issue. I don't begin to know. And I don't want to create in people a false sense of hope. The people I'm reading don't necessarily think we're going to survive this. You know, we had a great run. It was a nice 200,000 years. Um, we did a, we did manage to invent fission power without killing ourselves. Uh, it's too bad that we didn't realize that we were in population overshoot yeah. and that we were using carbon um, carbon based fuel in a way that was going to warm the planet to the point where we couldn't live on it anymore. So let me let me ask you a question because I mean, you know, I, I think most people when we talk about this, you see the lights go on, and when we stop talking about it, they move on to real housewives in New York or the Kardashians or the you know, whatever. You had another play that um, the one that you did at uh, the uh, Take Back Democracy March. Right. I, you know, without going into the play itself, although I would love for you to do that, talk to these people because, uh, you know, we don't see, you know, we, we see a lot of mick resistance out there. We see a lot of, hey, show us your tax returns, Trump, kind of nonsense. Right. Like death feeling waste of time. Talk to me about us as single individuals being able to take and become activists without quitting our day job. Talk to me a little bit about that so more people can get it. Well, the first thing everybody has to do is, you know, turn off Mr. Internet's machine and go meet their neighbors. I mean, that's huge. That's crucial. What nobody wants to acknowledge is how much Facebook has atomized our communities. And I don't know my neighbors in this building the way I did 10, 20 years ago. Organization is key. As for stopping the empire, look, whenever somebody says, well, you need the Second Amendment so we can get the guns and, and get rid of these guys, you know, Lech Walesa somehow figured out how to get rid of the Soviet empire out of Poland without firing a single shot. And Mahatma Gandhi did the same thing, getting rid of the most powerful empire at the time in, in the world without firing a shot. It has to do with the way that people, it has to do with the way people see themselves in terms of being consumers first. That's certainly part of it. 
we have a horrible class struggle here that nobody wants to acknowledge. We, you know, I did some teaching last year and I was at schools where tuition is 50K. Of course, those kids are well behaved because they're being primed to take those positions at Harvard and Yale and Princeton. And that's been the way that US society has worked forever, but we're becoming more cognizant of it because we're all rubbing up against each other. So how do you stop the empire while keeping your day job? Well, it takes some organizing. It takes some shoe leather. It takes, you know, actually getting on the phone instead of thinking that political engagement. Do you, do you watch um, Jonathan Pye? I do. He's fantastic. Yeah. I mean, Jonathan Pye nailed it. He said, posting on Facebook is not political engagement. And it's true. Political engagement is suddenly when there's a whole lot of people standing around blocking traffic. Um, I wrote a column earlier this week on my blog. And what I was talking about was the fact that New York has, it, we could get into the whole issue of money, but New York should not be acting like it's broke. And yet you can walk across the George Washington Bridge on the pedestrian path and you can see rebar bouncing against itself because it's rotted out through the concrete. That's a bridge that costs twelve fifty for anybody to cross and the money isn't being spent. And it isn't. And as you talk about with MMT, the money is there. It's a decision that is made by leadership. Yes, exactly. So right. leadership has decided for whatever reason, they're not going to fix the infrastructure. So how do you respond to that? Well, you could go with my Quaker friends who are doing national war tax resistance, and that's a very organized planning kind of thing that you have to do where bad things can happen to you if you go on tax protests with the IRS. So you have to have a support community. People don't have support communities the way they did. You know, everybody kind of laughs about the loss of church life, for instance, but a lot of those churches were supporting protesters. You think of the people who got involved in setting draft records on fire at Catonsville, Maryland. I'm sure you remember that generation, the Berrigans, right? Okay, the Berrigans didn't just show up with seven of their friends and say, we're going to do this. There was a year's worth of work. There were several years worth of organizing to figure what they were doing, how they would publicize it, and so forth. Protests don't just happen. They need to be planned just the same as weddings or bar mitzvahs or anything else. But people are not in the habit of doing that, and we're not in the habit of reaching out to others. And this is one of the problems when you're talking about near-term human extinction. People are upset. I mean, I don't even have to bring up the idea that we're all going to be extinct soon to hear the litany of complaints that people have about their lives. You know, I don't know, you know, you talk about the numbers in economics. I don't know where anybody thinks our unemployment rate is 4.6. No, it's not. You know, it is not. And the only way that it is 4.6 is because people have two and three jobs. The new jobs that are being created do not provide health care, do not provide a livable wage. Um, and that's a bipartisan failure. Look at how during the 2016 campaign, we were all told how everything was going to be great because the economy was in such terrific shape and you don't want to hand that over to Donald Trump. Well, the economy isn't in good shape. It's awful. It's awful. And you talk about weaning ourselves off of oil, and I don't think we can do it in time, but let's be honest. The oil that we're getting out of the tar sands, the oil that we're getting out of the shale, that takes an enormous amount of natural gas. So by the time they've processed it, it's actually something called bitumen, but by the time they've processed it into something that's usable in your cars, they're not making a profit on it if oil prices are less than, say, $90 a barrel, $95 a barrel. 
Right now, oil is selling for what, 43, 45? So there's a whole lot of junk bonds that are not being serviced right at this moment. And nobody is thinking about that either. Uh, and while I think any time that we're not using uh, fossil fuels is a good time, if those industries go up, if the banking system locks up the way it did in 2008, there are serious consequences to that. And that's one of the things I was talking about vis-a-vis -vis the nuclear power plants going down. It's not just a question of the electrical grid going out. So suddenly the cooling ponds aren't being serviced. Who's going to be hauling the diesel back and forth to the emergency generators? I mean, that'll work for, what, a week? And then suddenly people have this funny tendency when you stop giving them a paycheck, they don't show up for work. How are you going to keep this whole society running? Is, in fact, climate collapse just one aspect of a huge collapse that we're facing right now? And nobody wants to talk about it. Especially people who want to say, here's the idea, let's all dress up as fish and go parade. <laughs> and I love those people. I, I don't mean to disparage anybody. I think people take on the actions they can take on. I love the work of people like uh, Reverend Billy Talon, for instance. I think he has brought more awareness to the problems that we face in year 2015 through 2017 than anybody else. So, but then what do you actually do to tip the empire over? What do you do to tip over the empire while keeping everything in place enough so that we don't go into runaway climate change? Maybe we're already there. And if we're already there, who wants to be the spokesperson for that? Yeah, exactly. One of the things I started running on my blog was a column called They Don't Plan to Tell Us. And it's true. They don't plan to tell us. Uh, have you been following the news out of Grenfell? Yes, absolutely. That is an austerity-driven thing, though. But yes, absolutely. Right. But then, yes, absolutely. No, no disagreement on that. What I'm bringing up Grenfell for, we still don't have a count of who was there and who wasn't there, how many dead bodies there were. We know that one room, because they were celebrating the end of Ramadan, one room had 40 bodies in it. They haven't told us that building could have held 600 people and we've got 87 accounted for. Mm -mm -mm. Horrible, horrible. Do the people in charge know what's going on and do not plan to tell us. And the thing that you and I are facing, and I think, uh, you face it on a regular basis as well. I, I've come across it as a result of doing the shows at the Fringe. People really resent you if you're telling them the truth. Yes, they do. They really don't like it. Uh, one of the columns that uh, my friend Guy McPherson has written is about the fact that Elizabeth Kubler-Ross wrote about dealing with death and dying, and she found out pretty early in the game, I think, that people do not ever trust the person, the medical individual who's tasked with telling you that your time is up. Yep. You know, being the Cassandra is not a promising uh, line of uh, work. No, sir, it's not. Let, let me ask you a question, Dan. Sure. Um, we wind into the, the home stretch. Um, you know, one of the things that I found fascinating about your show, and mind you, I only saw the one, How to Be an Activist Without Quitting Your Day, blah, 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 blah. I found your demeanor, the, your your persona, when you're doing, I mean, you kind of came off as Ed Asner meets Clark Kent, and you, <laughs> had, the, you had the hat on, and you had the, and, and, but it was so fun. Like I, I, it was like you caught me by surprise, right? You really did. You caught me by surprise, and I didn't know what to make of you. You know what I mean at first because I'd never heard of you. And all of a sudden, I'm sitting there. You know, I have my Capitals jersey, and I'm like just sitting there. And all of a sudden, you went into. It, I was like, my. I mean, just whoop, just right on up there. T tell me a little bit about how you prepare because so much of getting this message out is how you do it. It's your delivery. 
and, and I think you're very effective. Can you talk Thank a little you. bit about how people might be able to, I mean, they're not all actors, obviously, but framing and, and, and presenting and, and how to knock down some barriers because you're a king of knocking barriers down. That's the whole point of your show is to get past people's, you know, barriers they put up so that they can hear this message through art and action, et cetera. Can you talk a little bit about that? It's a writing exercise. It's an acting exercise. Um, I went through a lot of various stages uh, of doing that character, Jerry. He was somebody I had met who was an actress. By the way, now that I've got a chance, um, folks, I'm very sorry. I've never been in prison. OK, I know I say that in the play. It's a play. I'm a character. OK, I'm sorry. I was offered to go to prison one time and my wife was a little pissed. So we didn't go to prison anyway. <laughs> but you find when you're talking to somebody, you find how they deal with the circumstance they're pushed into. So when I was writing about the priest who was disarming nuclear weapons, uh, he was somebody who didn't take guff from people, but he was really on that stage having a crisis of conscience. Like he really didn't want to go to prison and he knew that was going to be the result of what he was about to do. The character Jerry, he knows something and he's been sitting in the back watching everybody kind of spin their wheels and finally he comes forward and he says, all right, I think this will work. And he has great confidence when he does that. Now, the character I do in Planet Hospice, he's a college professor, and he's really smart and erudite, and he is trying to do anything to keep your attention because he's surfing through this whole tide of arcane knowledge where he has to come to the point and say, by the way, if you've understood all this, you understand why I'm telling you at this point, 25 minutes into the play, that we're all going to die. And there's great sadness in that, even though, you know, throughout he's tried to be entertaining and energetic and so forth. Each play kind of, and I've written for other people, by the way, so each play, the character kind of finds his own, his or her, I've written for women as well, his or her point of why they're telling you. And that becomes, that becomes crucial to how the play is presented. Um, there is no happier moment for me than when I get off the bus or the plane or whatever, and they say, you're going on to do how to stop the empire in 15 minutes. And I say, fuck yeah. <laughs> I really enjoy it. Um, the play that I'm doing right now about climate, a lot less so. Uh, I do a play that's kind of in workshop right now. One of the guys who figured out we were running out of oil is a fabulously nice 70-ish drunkard living in Ireland right now. And we have various interactions with the audience where he's sharing scotch with them and so forth. He has a very different attitude about the world because he's seen where his life is kind of coming to an end and he's just giving us a message. And I think he's trying to find a way to say, look, I was at fault, but so were a lot of other people. You know, each, each one of these plays has its own moments and touch points and Jerry for instance has never been a parent he's just never gotten it together um, I think he's scared everybody away because he's always got this edge to him the character in Planet Hospice did marry but he decided early on that it was cruel to bring children into the world and that informs a lot of the play as well it depends on who I'm writing about. It depends on what I've decided to say about them. Does that help or did I just 
no, waster. no, no. As a matter of fact, I, I think it's fantastic because I think what what happens, Dan, is we have a bunch of people out there who I think just sort of do things. They just do it. And and sometimes if you take a moment to think about how it's going to go down and how you can be effective and take, you see, I, I, I come from an Alcoholics Anonymous background. I'm an AA guy. Uh, you know, I don't drink, but I learned from people who learned how to not drink better than me, <laughs> who learned before me how to not drink one day at a time. And they passed that on to me. And I realized that I didn't need to recreate the wheel. I didn't need to become a special person. I just needed to follow some basic instructions and learn how to do things in a different way. And so I take that mindset of learning to do things a different way because they say the same man will drink again. Well, the same man will do the stupid shit he did before also politically and, and, and activism, et cetera. So right. for me, that whole constant iteration of oneself as we expand ourselves and, and enhance, enhance our approach to different things enhance our effectiveness is really key here because if you know what's at stake you know how important it is that we not waste any opportunities to interact with each other and you don't right. have to be the guy running around with the john 316 sign on the corner screaming the end is nigh or you know i mean you can sit there and you can find more effective ways of broaching these subjects to get people to organize and activate and make shit happen and um, so that, that's really what I was getting at with that. And, and I think you did a fantastic job. Well, so thank you. Thank you again. We, we, we are at the, uh, the coming of end time here. So I want to give you a chance to close out, pitch your blog, pitch your show, and we'll go ahead and break off. And hopefully we can have you back soon. So go ahead. So well, you're on. Okay. So here, here's what you need to know about me. You can go to my uh, blog, uh, Brooklyn Culture Jammers. And you can look at the 10 or 12 shows that I've written. If you have something that you want to say, we can talk. Um, you should look at Guy McPherson's website. He talks about near-term human extinction. He's currently doing a tour in the Midwest. Catch him. It's important to your life. You should also catch his book, Extinction Dialogues, where he talks about what you do when you know you've got a short leash to work with. And should I say, come see me in October? I hope so. I'm not. I'm not a lead organizer this time. To be fair, this new one, I'm gonna. I think I'm gonna be speaking. Christina Marie uh, of the uh, Democracy Unity team uh, is putting together that march this year. I don't know that anything is uh, solid, but Christina Marie, if you're listening, get in touch with Dan Kinch. <laughs> and and one other thing. Even if you're the only guy to show up, even if you're the guy with a John 316 sign, what you need to remember is you're not just out there to change the world. You're out there to let, make sure the world doesn't change you. And so all of you good people who are out there who are still fighting the progressive fight and listening to all the grief from everybody else, you know, you got to do it. And even if you're the only person who can look in the mirror the next morning and like what they see. That's what it's about. That's a great ending, Dan. Thank you so much, sir. I really, really, really appreciate your time. And I really, really hope that we can work again together soon because I think you've got a lot more to add. Um, Thank you. I, I would like very much to talk to you again soon. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm easy. <laughs> I, I appreciate that. All right. Well, folks with that, I'm going to say thank you from myself and Dan. Um, Tomorrow night, of course, Joe Firestone will be with us. And Sunday night, of course, we'll have our normal Ellis show. Uh, in the meantime, here at 9.15, join Trish and Keith as they'll be doing uh, the Living Vegan show uh, coming up at 9.15 Eastern Standard Time. In the meantime, thanks again, Dan. Thank you all for joining us. We'll see you soon. Good night. Good night.